we're ready for another student webinar. We're at number 63. I wanted to let you know that today's webinar, we're doing a pearl. We haven't done a pearl of knowledge in a very long time. And I wanted to say a special thank you for Claire Wade, who uh, I know from Houston. And she has been an officer for the one of the Houston chapters, AAPC groups, and uh, also uh, she has been an intern with CCO. So special thank for, thanks to her for doing research for this particular pearl. And the pearl today that we're going to be doing is about neuropathy. Neuropathy is very, very common. And therefore, you it, it doesn't matter what type of coding that you do, whether you do profi, inpatient, risk adjustment, uh, auditing, this is going to be a very common diagnosis that you'll see, especially in people that have other diseases like diabetes and maybe thyroid issues. So, I want you to be able to take notes, but know that as a student, you have access to this content. And on our pearls, if you're not familiar with the pearls, these are the things that we're going to be going over. We look at the diagnosis, the diagnoses of the different conditions that we cover in the pearls. We look at the definition of the diagnosis itself or the disease process. We look at the anatomy involved as well as alternative terminology because when we use one diagnosis, a term, you might hear it referred to other types of terms. Neuropathy is also called polyneuropathy when it affects multiple areas. And so again, alternative terminology that you need to be aware of. Differential diagnoses. So if this diagnosis is given of, they think it's neuropathy, but it could have all the signs and symptoms of other conditions. So differential diagnoses are diagnoses that the provider is often doing testing to determine if it's A or B, right? Common signs and symptoms, we need to know those as coders because we have a definitive diagnosis, we don't code the signs and symptoms. And common medications used, especially helpful if you're doing risk adjustment, because you've got to draw that line. You've got to link the diagnosis with meat or treatment is one of the best ways or acknowledgement. And so knowing the medications that are commonly used to treat a diagnosis, very helpful with um, uh, risk adjustment. And then we're going to just talk about how the particular diagnosis is going to risk adjust and uh, the HECs involved. And then we'll wrap it up with any coding guidelines that you need to be aware of. I like to think of our pearls of knowledge as being sort of like a cliff note. If you remember those back in the day when you were in uh, school, maybe high school or college, and it's a condensed version of everything that you need to know about a particular novel. If you're where, you know, uh, maybe you don't have time to read War and Peace, so you get the cliff note version. It tells you who the characters are, the plot, what uh, person it's being uh, read in, and uh, kind of a synopsis. So our pearls of knowledge is an overall synopsis of the disease. We first started this with our risk adjustment course, but it's relevant to any type of coding that you're going to be doing. Understanding the disease and the disease process for all of the diagnoses that you could come across. So we're going to start with the diagnosis itself. Peripheral uh, neuropathy is, at, again, very common and it can be caused by multiple 
things. So when you come in with the signs and symptoms that we'll talk about here in a moment, the first thing that's going to happen is the provider is going to give a physical exam. And you'll note that in the portion of the report. And it might be a SOAP note. It might be uh, a consultation. And there's, or it can be just, you know, a regular visit. It could be an annual wellness visit. But the physical exam is very important. And you'll note in the physical exam in the area of neurology that it will state the findings if neuropathy is going to be a diagnosis possibly. So again, this could be a reference point for that line when you're doing risk adjustment. Now, it could also be noted in the extremities uh, section of the exam. And ex if you have a patient that has stated in the observation part where uh, uh, the well you got the two the subjective part the beginning the HPI where the patient's telling you mm, I've got this aching in my feet that won't go away and uh, it started about two months ago nothing seems to make it better I, I've taken ibuprofen I've taken Tylenol and now I'm starting to feel these tingles and this sharp pain in my fingers and I you know, uh, that's why I came in today. So again, that would be the first thing that you're reading. And you might already be thinking, hmm, okay, what is this, you know, could this person have neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, because they have it in their feet and their hands. And then uh, the doctor is going to observe the O part of the soap note and make some comments. And then in the exam, uh, one of the things that the provider is going to do is get a medical history. Does the patient have diabetes? Do they have anybody in their family that have diabetes or a thyroid condition? And you'll see in future slides why this is pertinent. Um, and when they say anybody in their family, they're talking about blood relatives, parents and siblings for the most part, sometimes even grandparents. It will be um, uh, pertinent for certain diseases. There'll be a neurological examination. And this isn't necessarily what we're thinking of is when you think neurological, I don't want you to necessarily think of the brain as far as um, intelligence. <laughs> you know, I know sometimes when you see the word neuro, you immediately think of the brain and you don't go past that and you think of uh, the ability, you know, IQ or cognitive issues, which that is part of neurology. However, uh, we're talking about the peripheral and the central nervous systems. And so you're the provider's going to look and see if you have good reflexes. They're going to see if you have muscle strength and tone. And if you can feel uh, like the little pinpricks or, you know, they're not going to like prick you with a pen, but can you feel that sharpness at the end of uh, those particular extremities? Uh, my son that has epilepsy, he goes to the neurologist pretty frequently, and the neurologist is, always checks this every single time they go uh, because uh, if there's going to be a problem with the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, then it's going to show up in those areas. The type of tests that the provider is often going to do to determine then if the patient has neuropathy. So we've got the, the exam and they're checking all those particular things we just mentioned. And then there's other tests that can help further determine what the provider suspects. So just because the patient has lost a little um, muscle strength or muscle tone in their extremities, could that be neuropathy? Maybe. But that tingling that they're feeling, you know, they we need to decide, is it a, maybe a vitamin deficiency? Because there are specific vitamins that your body needs that can cause those signs and symptoms. So we're ruling out with tests or trying to get a confirmation of something. I mentioned before diabetes. One of the number one reasons a person develops 
neuropathy is because of diabetes. You could have problems with your immune system. You could also have um, other conditions that would indicate peripheral neuropathy versus just neuropathy. They can do CT scans, MRIs. The reason they'd want to do this is maybe we have a problem with the spinal cord. If there is a herniated disc or uh, a bulging disc, uh, or maybe they have a fracture and there's some swelling in there, you didn't even realize that there was a fracture. I can't tell you how many times people came in to our ER when I worked there with a broken neck and they just had a sore neck and they had tingling someplace, you know, uh, and often um, bilaterally. And what would happen is we lived in a resort town with a, a big giant leg and they'd get in there on those wakes and uh, that because it didn't take long before they had scarabs out there, you know, once they came out with scarabs and you can imagine the wake that that would cause. So people would be in their nice pontoon boat or a smaller boat and they'd hit, that wake would literally be so hard that they'd fracture a cervical or any part of their spinal column. Uh, and you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily know it. People came in often with a broken neck or some type of a uh, problem with their spine and not realizing how severe it was. You could also have uh, tumors, and this could be a bone. It could you can have tumors along the nervous system. There's several types of tumors as well. It could be a mass that it doesn't necessarily mean it's benign or malignant. Um, so again, further testing would need to be done to determine that. There are other nerve function tests called, uh, one is an EMG, and that checks the electrical uh, activity that's going through the muscle itself to make sure that there's uh, not a compromise there. Oops, hold on just a second. I'm trying to teach myself to use a different button on the keyboard versus my mouse. Further testing that might need to be done is uh, with the nerve function test. They might do an autonomic uh, reflux and a screen that records how the autonomic nerve fibers are actually working. They could do a sweat test because if that connection for the brain is not there, then it won't sigil, signal the nerves to do what would be appropriate like sweating. And then also uh, sensory tests to make sure that, again, you're feeling, can you feel that vibration? Uh, can you feel the uh, uh, sensation of heat and cold? Because there are certain types of neurological conditions that takes that away from your extremities. They also can do a nerve biopsy. So they just clip a tiny piece of the nerve. Usually it's a sensory nerve that they're going to be working with to look and see if there's anything uh, abnormal about the nerve itself. And this is actually a picture of a nerve biopsy about to be done, uh, which I thought was pretty fascinating and I wanted to include that for you. They can do skin biopsies where they just take a little piece of the skin to see if there's a reduction in nerve endings. So maybe um, the fact that you don't have uh, normal nerve endings at the end of your extremities, that would be a possibility as to why you're having these sensations or lack of sensations while they're trying to determine, again, what's the diagnosis. The definition for neuropathy, there's actually two. Uh, one is damage. So you have a disease or a dysfunction, damage, disease, or dysfunction that is uh, associated to more nerves especially the peripheral nervous system. Now, I've got a little slide here in just a moment that's going to tell you uh, the peripheral nervous system and the uh, central nervous system. So you have the PNS, which is peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system, which is the, the spine and the brain. And then uh, peripheral nervous system is everything else, everything else in the body. 
this is a great graphic that uh, shows the different parts of the brain that uh, uh, what it controls as far as the nervous system communicating to different parts of the body, which again is something that I think is very fascinating. And uh, another note about neuropathy. Again, we're looking at damage, disease, or dysfunction, but we also want to find out what's causing it. Is it a de degenerative issue? Is it an injury? Is it an infection like sepsis or a disease like diabetes that's causing it? Or maybe the person's been exposed to medication that has caused problems or a toxin that the patient's been exposed to. And again, uh, in the beginning, I mentioned a vitamin deficiency that could cause that. There's also a, a few conditions that are neuropathy. They're another form of saying that the person has a neuropathy. One is Jillian Barr syndrome, and we're going to talk about that a little more. The anatomy that is involved with neuropathy, again, is the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Fantastic graphic to show you the difference. So with the central nervous system, the CNS, we have the brain and the spinal cord. Two things, and I always like to think of it as the central nervous system goes right down the center portion of your body. So you start with the head, the brain, and then you just go right down the middle or the central portion, the spinal cord. That's it. If we are dealing with everything else, and you can see how the nerves come off of both uh, uh, the very top of the spinal cord and the brain and then comes down and out there's laterality there then every part of your body has this uh, peripheral nervous system exposure it's in everything whether you tickle somebody in the axillary you know under the armpit whether you touch their fingertips whether you touch their toes whether you touch their back even if you touch the outside spine all right that's still the peripheral nervous system it's the spinal cord which goes down the center of the vertebra in the spine and the brain is the cns everything else is the pns included in the pns is cranial nerves uh, autonomic nervous system and the ganglia and spinal nerves one way that i remember that whenever you're dealing with anything that has to do with nerves you'll use a g code and that's because of the ganglia if you know that the ganglia is part of the nervous system that's the g codes or you can remember that g codes are are the codes that are from the brain telling the body to go and do something in other words it is what it's the communication it's the google of the body right <laughs> I guess I don't know if you want to use that. Whatever it takes to remember that if we're dealing any uh, in any way part of the nervous system, meaning the CNS or the PNS, that code's going to start with a G, and that includes things like epilepsy is a G code, Parkinson's is a G code, right, uh, and neuropathy. I mentioned Julian Barr syndrome, and this is a definite marker for neuropathy. Now, if a person is diagnosed with neuropathy and then they do further testing and they say, well, you have Julian Barr syndrome. So neuropathy is a direct result of having this particular uh, syndrome, which is a genetic disorder. What happens is in the central nervous system, we have our uh, nerves themselves. And what they look like is I think of them as a cord. 
So let me find a cord. I'm going to pull this off of my thing. So here is uh, how I plug in my phone. Okay. And we'll say that the, the USB end is the brain. And we'll say that this is an extension. It's not the spinal, the, well, it's the, it's the nervous system going down. Okay. And you can say that it's the spinal cord, but it's not actually all of the spinal cord. Uh, but we're going to use this as an example. And this is what a normal would look like. However, if you have Jillian Barr syndrome, then this is all frayed and tattered. Okay, and the uh, nerve fibers are actually exposed. So the cord that this one is nice is kind of a cloth, a little silky, uh, very, very nice. It actually has little rubber on the ends here so that uh, by the little port inserts so that uh, there's extra strength to it. And that's how your spinal cord would be. But that outer layer of that silky cord is wrapping wire and that's how it communicates and that's how your central nervous system communicates as well it's like little wires throughout the body and that cord would be the myelin and in a frayed cord the myelin is exposed and what happens then the the cord doesn't work as well right you have flickering lights you your your phone doesn't charge very well uh, whatever you're using has the possibility to cause damage in that area right if you touch an exposed cord you could get a little shock uh, as well and so it's just not good quality anymore there's a problem so brand new cord Unlike neuropathy, where it would have worn out the cord because of the disease process, say the person has diabetes or a vitamin deficiency, and the cord gets worn out, this is different. You're born that way, okay? And uh, you may not be aware that you have a faulty cord in your system because whatever you feel is normal because you've always felt that. But ultimately, you have that frayed, exposed uh, wires and that's what uh, uh, Jillian Barr syndrome is and there is no repair for that so what do we do when we have a bad cord we throw it away right and you can't throw away your nervous system how Jillian Barr actually works is there is that frayed cord and your body doesn't know how to react to that as well. So not only do you have damage, but there's a problem with the communication. And um, you will have difficulty with muscles. Uh, a lot of times paralysis is a result because you have these autoantibodies in your system. This, this is a fantastic little graphic to explain this. And all of this stuff is uh, notated. If you want to go find it, uh, you can see it in the resources. And uh, even, but this is just particular art work explaining it. So let's start with the autoantibiotics in the middle. So you've got this antibiotic and it knows when something's amiss. So when you have the Jillian Barr, you have a problem with the muscles when it has a flare or you know when it starts to to cause problems because the auto antibiotics are confused and they look at this they're using a pink antigen and it's called a pink antigen by the way uh, other graphics show a little pink pig uh, so you notice the little pathogen there and it says what a dumb antibody it's confused it's gullible it's easily duped just like their manufacturer right and then the the auto antibody is you know what what do i what do i need to do i need to attack something but we've got uh, there's too many things to attack and i'm confused i don't know which is bad and which is good so ultimately it either shuts down or it attacks both and if it attacks the muscle then the sensory nerves to the muscle then you got a problem and um, uh, it will stop working and notice it says smooth and fast nerve conduction that's what those little nervous cells look like I've got another graphic 
to show you in, in the future what the different types of nerve cells look like. Peripheral neuropathy is different in that it's peripheral, meaning those extremities, you know, where our fingers and toes, our hands and feet is where we get the pain. And uh, it's usually a result of damage, not in the nervous central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, it's damage that's happening to those tiny little nerves, those smaller than a hair uh, little nerves in those extremities. The uh, there ends up being a miscommunication often of pain to the central nervous system when this happens. One of the most common things that causes peripheral neuropathy is diabetes. And when you have neuropathy uh, caused by diabetes, or you have a patient that has diabetes and neuropathy, there's a causal relationship there. And so therefore, you're going to use the E11.4 code. Now, there's other characters that you need to explain what's going on. But uh, 4 is the diabetic uh, code. Uh, that is anything neural. And again, neuropathy is part of the nervous system. So whenever you have a condition that's affecting the nervous system and the diabetes, it's going to be an E11.4 something code or E10.4 if it's type 1 diabetes versus type 2. Anytime you have a patient that's a diabetic, if they don't have neuropathy yet, they're probably going to get neuropathy, depending on how long they've been a diabetic, whether they're the type 1 or type 2 in their age. It just messes with the nervous system. It, uh, it very, very seldom, and it, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but that's the first thing I look for. If a person's a diabetic, I want to know if they're on insulin, if they're on pills, or not, so like uh, glipizide or metformin for their diabetes or a type of insulin. And the next thing I look is, are they on a medication for neuropathy? Because they probably have neuropathy as well. And then we're going to talk about the medications that are common. What is that type of pain that you'll see described in the, H, uh, the HPI by the patient? They will say it's stabbing, burning, or tingling, um, they uh, can treat the signs and symptoms, but it's really just to stop the pain, okay? Once you have peripheral neuropathy, you don't get rid of it, uh, but you can help with the pain. Now those signs and symptoms. Notice this graphic. We have three types of those nerves or types of neurons is what we were looking at in that other graphic where the, you know, the, the little auto uh, uh, nerve was saying, what, what do I need to do? Uh, we have sensory nerves. We have um, also motor nerves. And then we have uh, neurons. And you know what? I can't read that in the yellow off the top of my head. I can't remember what it was. But, um, oh, I think I've got it written here. You've got autonomic nerves that control the functions such as blood pressure, heart rate, digestion, bladder, motor nerves. Motor nerves. That's what it was. Oh, no, no, no. It's autonomic. So you have sensory nerves, and that's going to do all the sensations. That's going to do the temperature, pain, vibration, touch from the skin. Thus, they do those sweat studies, right? Motor nerves that, again, control muscles so that when, like in that Jillian Barr, is often paralysis is, is affecting the patient at some point in their life. Autonomic is going to be, again, the blood pressure and things like that. Uh, if a person has POT syndrome, I have a daughter that has POT syndrome, and usually POT syndrome is something that happens to people when they get older, and it's the autonomic nervous system not being able to communicate, uh, or in, usually that happens when a person sits up. When they're older and they stand up from a sitting position, their blood pressure bottoms out because of the nerves not communicating properly and they can faint or they stumble a little bit. And uh, so it's, it 
does happen with juveniles. And I just happen to have a daughter that, that got diagnosed with that. Other signs and symptoms, uh, peripheral neuropathy might include uh, that it isn't numbness that just happens overnight, that it slowly builds up to where it gets so painful that the patient finally goes to the doctor about it. Uh, and again, they could have extreme sensitivity to touch. So you could um, pick up a cold glass and it, it feels colder to you. Very uncomfortable. It's kind of like having a bad tooth and you drink, uh, uh, whether it's cold or hot, it doesn't matter. If it's, it's one or the other, it causes pain. They, uh, People that have pain when they shouldn't have pain for an activity, such as maybe you go for a long walk and then you start noticing that you're having pain in your feet when you walk and it takes a, it doesn't really go away. Uh, it's just not as severe. And then it gets to where it's worse and worse and worse when you walk. Well, your feet shouldn't hurt when you walk above and beyond normal foot pain and it should go away. Uh, lack of coordination, falling, muscle weakness, and feeling like th that sensation that you're wearing uh, gloves. You know, you don't, you can't feel, you don't have that texture to be able to feel properly. And again, paralysis. If you have autonomic nerves, then you have a problem with tolerance to heat. Uh, you feel uh, very uncomfortable in the heat, you sweat more, and you have problems with bowel, bladder, and digestion. Uh, also, you can have uh, problems with your blood pressure. Again, it could bottom out on you at unusual times. With peripheral neuropathy, there's more than one uh, type of verbiage that you're going to see. Mononeuropathy means one. Okay, so one nerve is being affected. You can have multiple mononeuropathy, meaning you have one nerve in one part of your body and you have a one nerve in another part of your body. And then polyneuropathy just means that you have multiple nerves that are being affected. And again, polyneuropathy is what you see diagnosed most often in charts. Uh, at least that's what I see. Carpal tunnel syndrome, you may have heard of this. Whenever you have a, a, a constant rep, a repetition of a movement over a long period of time, that causes things like arthritis. But if it's going to affect the nerves uh, versus like the joint, then it ends up being mononeuropathy. So carpal tunnel syndrome is that nerve that comes down through the palm of the hand and up that uh, uh, tunnel, the carpal tunnel in your arm. And uh, again, this, uh, this would be called a mononeuropathy or there's a code for uh, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Conditions that you need to be aware of that could be uh, an attribute to the, the neuropathy is the autoimmune diseases. Now, I spoke about Jillian Barr because it's one of the things, one of those go-to, but they also have uh, uh, Sjogren's syndrome and lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. These are all uh, associated to other types of neuropathy. I just happen to have one son that has RA, was diagnosed at 14. So again, having people in your family that have diagnoses like these sure make you better at being uh, a coder and finding this stuff because it kind of makes sense. You've heard the verbiage and talking about it. Uh, chronic inflammation uh, disorders and polyneuropathy uh, uh, let's see, oh, and, and vasculitis, uh, the vessels in the extremities get inflamed. Diabetes, again, the most common associated diagnosis with polyneuropathy. And um, notice it states here, more than half the people with diabetes develop some type of neuropathy. And I would say it's probably more than that from but that's because I look at people's charts uh, for the most part that are of a certain age, meaning um, they're older. Yeah. 
infections can cause problems. Epstein-Barr virus, your hepatitis, leprosy, which is out there. We don't see it very much in the U.S. Diphtheria and also HIV. Uh, don't forget, HIV is an autoimmune disorder caused by a virus. Uh, inherited, uh, like Char, uh, some Marie Tooth uh, disease, are hereditary. And uh, notice there is other ones that are listed here. Hashimoto's uh, is one. Rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, asthma can also be associated with it. Celiac disease. These are all diseases that they can go in and check. Uh, hereditary forms that can cause neuropathy. Tumors. Now, it could be malignant or it could be benign. Different types of tumors that can press on a nerve or be associated with the nerve itself. Uh, but a lot of times they could be bone cancers. Uh, bone cancers like to develop in the spinal, uh, the, the spine itself, the vertebra. And they can cause a degenerative disc disease that would uh, cause complications to the nervous system. Bone marrow disorders as well and uh, things like thyroid issues. You can have kidney disease, liver, because we already mentioned uh, cirrhosis, I think. Did I mention cirrhosis? Connective tissue disorders, MS, that uh, will cause pain. But when those muscles and MS is happening, it's going to uh, destroy the nerves too, right? Uh, but hypothyroidism is, is also uh, something that you'll notice that if a patient has hypothyroidism, a lot of times they'll be on some type of uh, neuropathy medication. Other conditions that can attribute and cause neuropathy, alcoholism. And ultimately what happens is you can get cirrhosis of the liver, but you end up with vitamin deficiencies that we mentioned at the beginning. Maybe you've been exposed to a toxin. Uh, heavy metals can do this to people. Medications, uh, when people are taking chemo treatments, there are some chemo drugs that are very, very hard on the peripheral nervous system. Maybe you had trauma. So those people that uh, had uh, went out on the lake and big old scarab goes by and it, you know, and they're all in their pontoon and you hit a wake and you, you come down, you're just sitting there and you fracture a cervical uh, uh, spine, then Again, that will cause swelling and, and trauma to the peripheral nervous system. The vitamin deficiency that is the most common to cause it uh, a problem with neuropathy is a vitamin B, but it's not just, you know, one vitamin B. It's uh, B1, 6, and 12. So people that have uh, certain types of anemia, like pernicious anemia, that need to have vitamin B, 12 injections, they could suffer from neuropathy. There's also vitamin E and niacin that are very, very helpful in making sure that the nervous system stays healthy. Uh, also, uh, there it could just be something where they don't know. It could be idiopathic. They can't link it to anything else. Hypothyroidism, let's circle back to that. Um, it's uncommon cause of peripheral neuropathy, but you see it actually quite a bit. Uh, remember that diabetes is an endocrine disease. Well, the thyroid, anything that goes wrong with the thyroid, it, the thyroid is an endocrine gland as well. And so um, it it's based off of the hormones in the body. And again, it can cause that neuropathy. And I see it pretty often in elderly patients. A lot of times they will have uh, diabetes and be on some type of thyroid medication. And ultimately, you'll notice that they'll have neuropathy as well. Don't forget that uh, the peripheral neuropathy is the peripheral nerves, and then they are directly related to the CNS, the central nervous systems, but 
uh, it is the extremities where they use where they feel the pain. Oops, wrong thing again. Carpal tunnel, this is going to backtrack on that. Uh, what happens is with carpal tunnel, again, it's in the wrist. And you'll see when a person's had carpal tunnel uh, surgery, and they'll have a big scar from here to here where they opened this up. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, they take care of that transverse ligament there, the ulnar nerves there and the medial nerve, and it's usually the median nerve, and they clip and do some uh, specifics in there to, to help with that pain because it's chronically inflamed. There's too much swelling and pressure there. Uh, I grew up in an area where there was a big factory that made engines, small engines, and it was, people were notorious for having carpal tunnel syndrome after they'd work there for a while because they were constantly doing these wires, you know, wrapping these wires around things. And so that repetitive movement year after year after year just destroyed that particular uh, nerve and they would have carpal tunnel syndrome and then they have to go have surgery. Now let's talk about the medications. Uh, one of the medications that you'll see most often is gamapentin used for neuropathy pain. Uh, what happens is that you that pain is an inflammation uh, and uh, that lack of uh, communication because of damage. So when you have normal communication, you have the axons and the um, mitochondria that is uh, there in the nerve endings. And then you have a dendrite also. So they're communicating. And there's these little fibers or receptors um, on one side. And then on the other side, you have um, the axon and the my mitochondria. And in between, there's neurotransmitters and there's enzymes that are going back and forth. So what happens that allows to, the, the decrease in pain is that the gamma benton uh, binds to the receptors to reduce the neurotransmitter release. So that communication is broken or buffered, I guess you could say, and so therefore less pain. Now, you don't take the medication, the pain comes back because it's just a buffer. Right. Uh, and sometimes you have to take more. But um, I know my husband has carpal tunnel really, really bad in his arms and he has bursitis and some other things uh, from years of working heavy uh, uh, equipment or doing construction work for years and years and years. And so they put him on gamma benton, but he wouldn't take it all the time. He would only take it when he hurt. I was like, well, it doesn't work that way. You got to take it all the time or that buffer goes away. Lyrica is also a medication that is used. Um, I found a, a great article that said, what's the, you know, what's the uh, difference or is Lyrica better than gamapentin? Because gamapentin has been used for a long time. Lyrica is newer. It's been out for a while, but it is newer. And so I thought, you know, that's really interesting. We need to constantly be doing research and and staying on top of this medication because Lyrica is actually used for other things. And um, uh, it is used uh, for some people for seizures. But again, remember, it's all neurological, right? So it would, it, uh, a lot of times, uh, heart medication, cardiac medications are actually used for other stuff, right? And um, they found that Lyrica is really, really helpful in nerve pain. But what makes the difference is that Lyrica is able to be absorbed into the system, um, I guess, faster or better than gamapentin. And so, therefore, uh, it, you know, works better, they're saying, than gamapentin. And again, uh, it is a medication that was originally uh, uh, used for other things. It was still affecting the nerves. However, they found that it really worked good for diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy and fibromyalgia, as we learn more about uh, that. So in the charts, you're either going to see the patient on gamapentin or Lyrica. And um, even notice that the generic name 
uh, for what well, Lyrica is actually doesn't have a generic. I don't think it's out in generic yet. So you're going to see it as just Lyrica. But Gamma Benton is, uh, might come up in other names. Uh, I only see it in Gamma Benton, so maybe it is too. Uh, other medications that you might see used for peripheral uh, neuropathy based on the reason that the patient has it, thus the diabetic, is you may see that some patients are on Synthroid or Levothyroxine, which is uh, to treat the thyroid condition, the low thyroid output. And um, again, Synthroid, it, very common in charge, but most of the time you see Levothyroxine uh, written in there. And uh, But why are they taking it? They're taking it, they're having nerve pain, but why are they having nerve pain? Because the thyroid is uh, at very low output, hypothyroidism. So again, you could see a patient using uh, Synthroid or uh, the generic levothyroxine as a, uh, and give that link for nerve pain, if that's why the, the provider states the patient's having the nerve pain. Uh, but one of the best treatments is exercise. You don't want to be overweight because anything constricting on those little damaged nerves is going to be a uh, problem. And when you're carrying excess weight, then again, it's just pressure in the body, uh, as well as uh, the muscles, the different types of fat that we have in our body. Um, the, the fat layers are really there close to the skin the, at where the nerves are. Right. So the top layer of our skin is definitely, um, you know, that's you can feel that. But the, the nerves are in that second layer of skin. OK. Uh, so, again, uh, having a good weight is going to be helpful and keeping your extremities healthy and lean. Now we're going to uh, talk about the risk adjustment uh, association with neuropathy. If a patient has diabetic complications and neuropathy we know is associated, then it's going to carry an 18, which 18 is a, a diabetic HCC with complications. So if a patient has diabetes, type 2 diabetes, no complications, they're a 19. Uh, you know, so E11.9 is a 19, but any type of complication with diabetes is going to be an 18 including um, the Z79.4, which is long-term use of insulin, even if you're a type 2, that makes it an 18 because that, that carries an 18. So again, we have diabetes, we have a neurological can uh, complication, peripheral neuropathy, uh, uh, then it'll be a, a nine, an 18. If it's an RX HCC, it uh, carries a 75 if you're collecting for RX HCCs associated to the medication involved. And then other related codes would be 40 and 75, which I'll show you here in a moment. Um, uh, here we go. So 75s would be those G codes. The polyneuropathy codes, and I'm not going to read all of these off to you, but I did mention in the beginning that they are G codes. Notice they're all G6 codes. We have that hereditary and uh, idiopathic neuropathy, the Gillian Barr syndrome, their uh, G6 2.1 alcoholic polyneuropathy. Again, they can get very, very specific radiation induced polyneuropathy. Neuropathy, so the patient had radiation treatments that has damaged the nerves and causes the pain. Uh, G6 2.82. If it's just plain old polyneuropathy and it's not associated to anything else, G6 2.9. But of course, we have our E codes for any diabetic related, which here is an example of those. We have different types of diabetes. EO8 is a, you know, like it's secondary to something else causing the diabetes. Then you have type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And um, really, really common code is E11.42 polyneuropathy. Uh, there is sometimes you'll see mononeuropathy, but for the most part, the most common code you see with diabetes and neuropathy is E11.42 for polyneuropathy, but uh, the doctor may say uh, autotomic 
polyneuropathy. And again, don't get confused. Know that there's specificity there, and it would be E1 1.43. And then um, the 40 and 75 codes uh, would be if a person had rheumatoid rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid polyneuropathy. So they would carry a 40 and a 75. The guidelines that you should be aware of uh, directly related to diabetes is that if you have a patient that's diabetic with uh, polyneuropathy, then you're going to code the E11.42. You do not need to code for uh, the G code for the neuropathy because it's captured in the E11.42 code. Uh, however, if you have a condition like the hypothyroidism, then you're going to code both. You're going to code the G63 for the polyneuropathy and the E03.9 uh, for the hypothyroidism because unlike diabetes, there's not a causal relationship. In other words, m almost always if a patient has diab diabetes and neuropathy, it's, it's uh, diabetic polyneuropathy, causal relationship because it happens so frequently less common, as you noticed in that one slide where it said it's not as common, uh, would be to have hypothyroidism, which causes polyneuropathy. There's not a combo code for that. Uh, and uh, so you'll use two separate codes for the um, polyneuropathy and the hypothyroidism. And then uh, again, that last paragraph is just uh, in all of the ICD stating that, you know, you are coding based on what the provider has documented. And that's it, guys. So uh, if you like these pearls, and I love our pearls, we have several already in the club or uh, for our RA students, definitely, uh, you have access to those. If you want access to the slide deck, the transcript, any other conversations that go along around this lecture, you're going to join the CCO club. And it's real easy to do. Just go to cco.us forward slash club. It's a minimal price of, you know, um, uh, a small fee every month. And then you get access to all of our webinars, our student and Q&A. So you also get uh, help with other things besides just the coding, billing, risk adjustment. And also, um, we often have people send in scenarios or, or um, notes, encounters that they're having difficulty determining codes with. And we have experts, subject matter experts, to look at those help you do some research. Uh, and then we have, again, extended product and support. It's so easy, guys, to join the club. And it's uh, for the small fee that it entails, it's worth it. Uh, we have uh, lots of testimony of people who have said how beneficial it is. So take some time, go to the cco.us forward slash club. Know that um, the contents, you know, we're pumping that out to you free. However, all of this other behind the scenes and this extra stuff is exclusive for our students and our club members. So thank you for joining. Don't forget that we also are associated with Find a Code. All of the HCCs and all that information that uh, we pulled and Claire pulled, a lot of that comes from uh, Find a Code. And if you want to get a discount on Find a Code, go to cco.us forward slash Find a Code. I love them because they are also um, uh, very educational based or educational thinking in all the products that they uh, use as well as their site, uh, their encoder. It is probably the one of the most easily navigated encoders I've ever experienced. And so if you would like to know more about that, uh, go to the cco.us forward slash find a code and you can also ask questions in the club about find a code and we'd be more than happy to help you with that. They also have some other sister organizations where they have uh, educational tools that are very beneficial to you. We'll be showing you those more in the future. 
And that's it, guys. So thank you for joining us. Uh, again, if this was beneficial, tell your friends and uh, let them know that we offer these videos, the student webinars, the um, club webinars, and for all of our students, we also have open house uh, office hours on Wednesdays where we, uh, if you're a student, you can just join and sit down with me for an hour and uh, ask questions. Again, cco.us forward slash club. I'd like to see you in there. Give me a shout out after you get in there. All right. Thanks, guys.